Hey, how's it going? Let's talk about the differences of doing a Pokemon solo run a single time versus doing one multiple times. Some Pokemon like Mewtwo and Gengar are very easy to pick up, do a single run, and just get great results. They are very intuitive, they're very straightforward, while other runs like Zapdos and Cloyster would leave a lot on the table if you only did a single run. They require experiences from the initial run and some adjustments to actually reach their potential, and they are not intuitive at all, which is the word of the day. So if you're someone like me that's building a tier list, multiple runs are a necessity. My philosophy on an end game tier list of Gen 1 values accuracy above all else, and I think I've done a really great job at just learning and getting better at the game over time. There are some early runs that I need to go back and redo later to give them more of a modern chance, but at least I'm self aware of that. Video card prices are coming down, and maybe we can finally stream soon to make that happen more efficiently. Anyways, that was just a little bitty tangent. I've been thinking about that that as we get deeper into the tier list and let's just segue into today's video. Polyrath, my friends, it's not an intuitive Pokemon. If you picked it up and did a single run, it might seem like it at the start, but as the run plays out, you'll see that there's a good bit of variance and nuance into the choices that you can make and they'll all have an impact on your final time. If I only did a single Polyrath run, I would have left about 20 minutes on the table. Overall, I think I did about five and a half total runs. Now you got the test run, you got the full physical damage run, you got the special focus run, and then you got those last couple of runs to get the full refinements in to try to wrap it all up in a nice pretty bow for the video. And I'm sorry to that one guy who wants me to release every test run that I do, but that's just not possible, buddy. As of right now, outside of Scott's thoughts versus run that's completely different than the premise of my videos, no one else has done a Polyrath video at the time of me writing this script. If somehow that sneaky little devil J-Rose gets one out before this video releases at the end of July, go ahead and leave about 15 comments like you guys did for the Lapras video because it helps out the algorithm. It doesn't annoy me at all. I'd also like to quickly say that the rules I do for my solo runs are always down in the description as well, so take a look at that if you are interested. I once had someone comment on my TikTok page asking why I didn't just catch a Mankey to make Brock easier, so at least read the title at bare minimum, please guys. And before we begin, I'd like to say that I do solo run content often, and if that is of interest to you, consider subscribing to be kept up to date. Likes and comments are really what helps channels grow, and if you're someone that normally doesn't really think about that sort of thing, or maybe you just don't know what to say, just scroll down and type in Hypnotoad, because everyone loves Hypnotoad, and that's really all you gotta do. It's just that easy. And with that out of the way, sit back, relax, grab yourself a soda pop, and let's just get to it. From the start, like all of my runs, I set Polyrath in place of Squirtle via the Universal Pokemon Randomizer, and I make sure that it has perfect IVs in order to get the best representation for our little froggy boy. Today's name for the run will be Hypnotoad, which is a reoccurring animal on the Futurama series, and you should probably look it up if you've never heard of it before, because it's funny and it's a perfect fit with the hypnotic swirls and the fact that this Pokemon evolves from a tadpole. Now from the intro, you can probably tell that it took me several runs to get this Pokemon mastered, and while I'm gonna say that Polyrath isn't intuitive, it's going to be hard to tell from the start. The combination of being a water type, having water gun, and having access to an early body slam means that just like we saw in the cloister video, Polyrath is just going to be tailor made to have an elite level start. Unlike later in the run, this first part of the game is very intuitive and you only have to do the bare minimum to get the rock solid Pokemon trainer down. The only thing to really say about Brock is that Water Gun normally isn't a one shot. In this clip, you'll see the average attempt that I had over my five runs. It takes two Water Guns on each of his Pokemon to get them down. It's very quick, it's very painless, but it is worth noting that I actually had a better attempt on a previous run where I got a crit on the Geodude, and then there's actually a range on the Onyx to one shot it too. It was faster, but it's not a big deal because it's very unlikely that it's going to happen consistently. From there, going to Mount Moon and up to Cerulean is nothing but business and minimum battles once again. The only real strategy difference in the adjustments that I made in my later runs is that you need to utilize Water Gun here and exhaust its PP first. You'll need Body Slams for later, and Double Slap is weak, and generally you only use it to clean up low health enemies. I also skip Mega Punch, and that saves me a little bit of time as well. I also pick up the Dome Fossil for this run as a throwback to last week's Dome Dude video. It's always real isopod hours in our hearts. Once we get to Cerulean, the PP is wearing a little bit thin, but you do have 
pretty much just enough to quickly take on rival number two. There's not really much to say about this fight. You pretty much spent the whole early game using water guns so that you have enough body slams to get through this one pretty easy. I avoid any pesky Pidgeotto sand attacks and that means I'm able just to brute force my way through this fight without much opposition. Now after the fight and something that kind of varied in my attempts is that sometimes you have just enough PP left over to where you can go ahead and start taking on the first trainer of the Nugget Bridge and that's what happens here. It's not a big deal if you don't have enough PP but spoiler alert, after you heal this time at the Cerulean Pokemart, this is the last time that Poliwrath is going to visit a Pokemon Center for the entire run. My favorite part of this run is utilizing the resources available to me so that I'm basically not wasting any time, but we'll talk about that later, let's keep it rolling. After healing, I immediately head to Misty, and this was a situation that I kind of hoped that Kabuto would be in last week, where our water typing makes her good AI only go for tackles. This is a very easy and very safe battle. It's not really worth going into any strategy for this one, but it is key that we get this one out of the way right now before finishing up Bill's house. And that's because Bubble Beam is key for this run. It gives you one shot power going towards Bill's house. And I've talked about this before, but since about 15% of the game's trainer are located in this segment of the game, it definitely makes your overall time faster. I found in my multiple runs that you should not be stingy with power points because when you want to see the maximum potential of a Pokemon, taking extra turns in lots of battles can really add up at the end of the game. It's also worth noting that I pick up the Hidden Elixir, although the Onyx Hiker would have been the easier battle. Elixirs and Aethers are things that I normally use, but I don't fully utilize them like I'm going to do in this run specifically. I really went out of my way to learn how to maximize all the items available to me and really push this run to its limits going forward. Let's pick back up in Vermilion, and I made a key change here from all of my other runs. Visiting shops and menuing takes significant time, especially when you play on faster speed. It's something that can really add up very quickly. For the first time in any of my videos, I decided to buy all of my potions here and all of my repels for the entire run because I've been trying to improve my runs and experimentation is always great. I think about 18 repels might be slightly too much, but it's better safe than sorry because I did get caught out just shy on one of my test runs. This doesn't seem that significant now, but generally I would always buy max repels and Cinnabar at the end of the game so that I can get through the Pokemon Mansion and Victory road and doing this right here allows me to completely bypass that so if anyone plays along or just likes to mess around in solo runs practicing your menuing and minimizing how much time you spend in those menus can really shave off a lot of time on the SSN we already have body slam so we can skip that I also pick up the optional rare candy guarded by the gentleman I wanted to cut this out but the extra level does help believe it or not and this little bit of extra experience you get from this battle also helps out a little bit but after that that, it is time for rival number three and this battle isn't really anything worth diving into body slam and bubble beam are just a very strong core and they make short work of his team Something I haven't mentioned yet and what most top tier evolved runs don't have is that Poliwrath is in the medium slow leveling group. Now in my opinion, that is the best leveling group. It allows us to reach level 25 the fastest out of all the leveling groups and it lets us quickly transition into the mid game seamlessly, especially if you compare it to runs in the slow leveling group. Now let's take a look at Surge. The usual problem exists here. Water typing against the electric Pokemon can always be an issue, but the first two Pokemon are just whatever. I do use Bubble Beam, and it's not enough to one-shot the Voltorb. I do this because I only have one Body Slam left, and I know Body Slam's a one-shot on the Pikachu, and I don't want to get paralyzed, so I'm saving it to avoid that situation. Now as for the Raichu, I get blasted immediately with the Thunderbolt, and I go all the way down to 3 HP, but I haven't really mentioned hypnosis at all in this run and from the Psyduck video and other runs that use sleep strategies you know that it's tailor-made for situations like these you guys didn't think that I was called hypno toad but didn't have hypnosis did you so I put it to sleep and a couple of turns later I get this one down on the very first attempt and that's excellent news without hypnosis things would have definitely been more of a struggle and after the battle it's just kind of unfortunate that we can't learn Thunderbolt for coverage but it is what it is let's keep moving on Going towards Rock Tunnel, this is where I start to utilize resources. I finish off my potions, I use a super potion, but more importantly, I use a pretty early elixir here. It was my mission here to not heal outside of the one time in Cerulean, 
And this was something that took me a few runs to get used to because of the pacing and you want to make everything work out correctly and line up right. Now skipping over Rock Tunnel, let me introduce you to this tiny, seemingly insignificant hidden item that I never talk about. There's a Max Elixir right outside of Rock Tunnel and it's something that cost me significant time in another run and pretty much ruined it because I forgot. You see, Polyrath doesn't have the raw power or the deep move pool that something like a Mewtwo or a Nidoking has. And an item like this is needed to completely avoid the Poke Centers for Polyrath. It's something that I don't normally get because you don't need it. And when I talked about this run maximizing my resources, this was a key part in that. Before we get to Celadon, there's a couple of minor details I'd like to point out. The first is the Shakespearean suit wearing gambler with the two fire types. Now doing this run so many times, I'd like to just say that you should use Bubble Beam here because if you try to be skimpy with your PP, you will not one shot them with Water Gun. And like I just said earlier, there's tons of little battles like this to where if you use the wrong move, it's going to cost you a turn and it's just going to add up slowly. And also something that I don't think I've mentioned yet, something that I didn't know for a long time, is that you can actually ride your bike in the underground tunnel. It's not too much of a time save, but it is a time save nonetheless, and I've always just straight walked through here without my bike and other runs. It's just another small detail. Moving on, finally in Celadon, once again I'll be skipping over the Mart for now so I can afford more vitamins for later. I'll go ahead and get Fly, and then we can continue on the normal routing for now. I take on the Rocket Hideout next, and I do use a PP up on Body Slam, and if you didn't know, it not only raises the cap of your power points, but it'll also give you that many more uses. So in Body Slam's case, if you're at 0 out of 15, you use a PP up, it'll be 3 out of 18 now. So it gives us 3 more uses, and I can continue to stretch out my move usage going forward. And I know I go over this a lot, but if you are a newer viewer, I want to quickly say that during this segment, the Pokemon Tower segment and the Safari Zone part, I pick up high money items like HP ups, irons, and nuggets, and I accrue as much money as I can when I finally visit the Celadon Mart, so I can just afford more vitamins to help us out. I'll be skipping over Giovanni because it's not interesting, and let's pick back up in Erica's gym. And here's where I use a max elixir on Body Slam, and that's gonna just barely bridge the gap between here and the free heal in Pokemon Tower, so let's just kinda dive in. I'm a water type, and doing this gym early as a water type has a lot of risk involved because of that 100% crit razor leaf. But guys, hypnosis, it's the great equalizer. And Polyrath's pretty quick, I do outspeed, and all I need to do is get an attempt where I get a turn one sleep, and that's exactly what happens the very first time. Once that's over with, it's body slam for days, and I'm able to slam my way through the rest of the fight with little issues at all. Taking on Erica now is a pretty big adjustment that I made through my five Polyrath runs, and as far as being intuitive goes, this is something that you would normally not do on a water type, especially if you aren't going to be using Ice Beam like I am, and this, my friends, is one of the many reasons that you cannot just give a Pokemon a single run and think that you can rate it on a tier list. Now I'm going to play a sped up rival number 4 in the background. As it stands now, I don't have a super effective for Gyarados, and I never will, and while it's not as oppressive as it is in other runs, it's just worth mentioning. It's also worth mentioning that I have the near perfect amount of body slams for this spot and just the right amount of bubble beams to get past the ghastlies coming up next before I get my free heal, so let's just keep it rolling. Now skipping ahead, moving down to Fuchsia, I'd like to quickly say that using Repel at the start of Cycling Road when you are picking up this hidden rare candy is also a time save. I normally don't do it. Taking the chance of getting random encounters is just generally how I usually do, but this is much more efficient and the correct way to handle this situation. From there I pick up the final HMs of the run, and then I can finally make my way to the one visit in the Celadon Pokemart. The vitamin choice for this run was interesting. At first I was going all proteins for some of my runs, then I was trying to get a mix of calciums and proteins for some, but after some thorough testing, six calciums are definitely needed. It's the perfect amount because if you have any less, you miss just enough power in some late game fights, and it will cost you some turns. Outside of that, I do pick up a fresh water to get access to Saffron, and I won't be using Ice Beam this run, I think I said that earlier. I immediately head over to Mr. Psychic to get Psychic, and I learn it immediately. It's very useful in the mid game going forward, and there's no reason to hold off on it. And since I'm in the area, I'm going to be heading directly to Silph Co to see what trouble I can get into. Like always, it's straight to the 10th floor, and this right here is just one reason that Psychic pays for itself in the long run. I talked about the importance of not being stingy and making sure that you can just one shot.
shot things to save turns. And Psychic gives you some key coverage, like against this trainer with the single Machoke guarding the goodies on the 10th floor. The rare candy here is nice, but Earthquake is the real prize. I'll be doing a decent amount of move swapping, and you might think that Psychic and Earthquake is a little redundant, and you'd be right, but this is more of a late game thing rather than something that we're going to be seeing anytime soon. Now let's stop messing around, let's cue up that music, let's dive straight into rival number 5. The lead as always is Pidgeot, and our fighting typing is about to come into play finally. Wing attacks will add up here, and Pidgeot loves the crit, so the familiar strategy of hypnosis into some psychics is what's needed here. It goes easy, it goes smooth, and I can just move on without taking too much damage. Next up is Gyarados, and it's not that bad as it is in some runs, but things like Dragon Breath would add up because I don't have the best HP stat. And once again, I'm going to that Hypnosis well. I get a little unlucky first turn, but I do get the second turn one to land, and it takes a few body slams to get this one down. So far, it's looking pretty good. Next up is Growlithe, and there's no reason to tell you what happens here. Let's move on, let the men have a conversation. Next up is Alakazam, and if you haven't seen my other fighting type runs, this is where the real problems come into play. I don't think Body Slam can one shot, so for a third time, I need Hypnosis to pull some overtime. I get hit with heavy damage from a confusion, and I roll a d20 on Hypnosis once again, but on my turn, I actually just crit on a Body Slam, so it's a one shot. It didn't really even matter, but like I said earlier, I don't think Body Slam would have one shot on its own. So now we have Venusaur. Razor Leaf would hurt, but I do outspeed, and you guessed it, I get really lucky, I can't, the odds of hitting Hypnosis this many times in a row is very low, probably about a 5% chance, but I hit it, and from there, I'm able just to use a couple of psychics, I finish the job, and I take the battle. And you might be saying, Matt, aren't you worried that you had to rely on Hypnosis so much? And to that, I say no, because I'm here at rifle number 5 a little early, I'm trying to maximize my end game time, and it's really not that surprising that I needed a little extra help going against one of the toughest trainers in the entire game with Alakazam on his team. But the one thing I will say that I'm surprised about is that I didn't lose a few more times and have to reset a little bit, but I'm not gonna reset and do the battle over again just because I won on the first time. Why would I do that? Anyway, I played Giovanni number two in the background and it's a very skippable battle and there's no need to really dive into that so we can just keep moving on. And with Sylph out of our way, I can clean up the gems and let's just start with Koga. And there's not really much to say about this battle. Psychic is great here, but I will say that Earthquake would be better and hit a little bit harder, but it's just not necessary. The only thing I'll say about this fight is I knew that I could get a fast heal at my mom's house before going to Cinnabar, so I stubbornly wanted to get this done at as low health as possible, and I get chipped down and ultimately get self-destructed on for a reset. So I don't heal, I just go right back into it, and I get just a little bit better luck on the next attempt, and I take the battle without taking any damage at all, and that's Koga over and done with. Like I just mentioned, I get another semi-free heal at my mom's house to get my PP back, and it's just quicker than going to a Poke Center, so I recommend doing this if you are doing runs of your own. And from there, I take the world's most nice and brisk swim down to Cinnabar, and like I said earlier, I want to elaborate on buying extra repels way back in Vermilion. I touched on the fact that I've been watching some speed runs, and I've been trying to refine some of my own strategies, so going immediately down to the mansion and having those extra repels allows you to completely avoid a decent amount of time wasting. Normally, I'd use my last repel on the way down here, I'd visit the Pokemart, I'd buy some Max Repels, buy some Hyper Potions to set us up to get through the rest of the run, but the strategy here in this run makes it completely obsolete. The only trade-off is that you have slightly less money when you visit the Celadon Pokemart, and the fact that regular Repels last significantly less time than Max Repels, but avoiding menuing and cutting out an entire shopping segment was something that I was very happy with at the end of the day. I do pick up Blizzard here, but before I talk too much about my nerdy optimizations. So with all the boring stuff out of the way, I do skip all the trainers towards Blaine, and after a little bit of Tombstoner, brother, let's challenge the gym. Honestly, what do you guys really expect? It's water versus fire. We've seen the same exact song and dance, many a run, but I guess I can talk about how Earthquake would be better here, or how Surf would be as well, but I'm strategically hanging on to my move pool so that I can be more flexible in harder fights, and you just have to trust me on this one. Bubble Beam 
does the job just fine here and I'm able to effortlessly get past this one. Now Arcanine does troll me a little bit. It gets a bunch of potions and I waste a bunch of turns, but I'm not too worried about a turn here and there. Now the last place to go is the Psychic Gem and I saved this for the end for very obvious reasons. Picking up with Kadabra, there's no issues here. I outspeed and I can one shot it. Mr. Mime is the same, although I do think the crit mattered here. Either way, I'll take it. And like it always seems to happen, Venomoth trips us up in this fight. After I fail to take it out with the Psychic, it paralyzes me and then it hits me for some pretty heavy damage before I finally take it out and this one's just not looking good. And just like you would think, Alakazam comes in, it bends me over and I have a quick reset. There's nothing too unexpected here on the first attempt. On the second attempt, I do get confirmation that it's not a one hit on the Mr. Mime without a crit and it goes for a confusion to chunk my health and of course I get confused, I hurt myself and I meander about a little bit before I finally take it out. Now I do actually hit some luck on the Venomoth this time. I just crit it with Psychic and I stop the inevitable stun spore that I know that it wants to do and now we can look at the raid boss once again. Alakazam comes in and I desperately need a hypnosis to land but it outspeeds. It goes for a side beam and it takes me all the way to the brink of death all the way down to 3 HP ladies and gentlemen but I get the hypnosis to stick and from there I'm able to body slam it down and barely hang on to take us to the home stretch. From there it's quickly on to the final Giovanni fight and let me briefly highlight this trainer with the two Machokes and the Machop. I've mentioned a couple of reasons why Psychic helps out and a battle like this against bulky physical defense Pokemon, it essentially halves the time I spend in battles like this and I just felt that I would share some more time saves throughout the video. Looking at Giovanni, this is the main reason I held on to Bubble Beam as long as I did. While Earthquake does work for most of the fight, some of his Pokemon, specifically the Rhydon, are just so defensively bulky that it would still take multiple turns. Bubble Beam just kind of smooths this one out and from my multiple runs I just found that it performed a little better. Now you might have noticed that I'm basically dead going into this fight and this one was not a one shot victory but the only reason it wasn't was because I just I'm so low I just I was being stubborn here. It would have been very trivial if I just healed here and went back in but I thought it would be kind of fun just to see if I can get through all the way and that's what I did. And that's the badge portion of the game over, and we can get to where the Poke Boys become the Pokemon and see if Polyrath has what it takes to take this one home. But first, guys, I make another tiny adjustment. In runs where I don't have a badge boosting move and I'm weak to several parts of rival number six, there's absolutely no reason to not just go ahead and use all the rare candies here and make this fight more consistent and quicker. So let's get that music going and just dive into the attempts. Pidgeot is the lead, and you might notice that I still still have Bubble Beam, and it's for similar reasons that I just mentioned. It just makes the Rhyhorn a little bit quicker, and I can utilize it on the Pidgeot as well for a two shot. I do take a wing attack, and that does some decent super effective damage, but it's not a big deal, we can move on. I just spoke about Bubble Beam here, and Rhyhorn is an easy one shot, so there's not much to say. Gyarados is next, and Body Slam is a two shot. Now looking back at the footage, you could probably just go straight Body Slam, but I do opt to play it safe and go for Hypnosis. I missed the first time. I take a leer back, so no harm, no foul, and I finish up, but I could have saved a little bit of time here. After that is Growlithe. It's as pathetic as always, and Bubble Beam just gets the job done. Let's move on. Next up is Alakazam. The strat here was to body slam it down. I think it would take two of them more than likely, so I would just tank a move, do another one, but I just crit immediately, and just like that, we're at the end of the fight. I do outspeed the Venusaur, but if I miss a Hypnosis, you already know that, that Razor Leaf is going to be coming out, and I do miss, but I actually survive a Razor Leaf leave but unfortunately I get some bad luck I do miss another hypnosis and I go down on the next attempt I fail in a very similar way but instead I'm even lower and I stand even less of a chance and on the third attempt you can see how Alakazam normally goes it hits me with a psychic for very heavy damage but this time I do get a paralysis proc on the body slam and I get to go again and we move past it and this time I do get the hypnosis to stick on the Venusaur and I'm able to psychic down to take the victory and arguably what was probably the hardest fight of the entire run, especially on my other runs where I didn't use rare candies first. I feel like through this part of the video, we can see that Polyrath has been pretty great, but it also has some clear cut weaknesses that the rival fights have brought out. And without delaying too long, we can just get through the Elite Four and talk about the strategies and decisions leading up to the gauntlet that I made throughout my runs. I do skip the rare candy of Victory Road because as far as in game time goes, it was really crunch time here and I wanted to be as fast as I could. Before 
heading into Lorelei, I do finally replace Bubble Beam with Earthquake, but let me just go ahead and say that I think hanging on to Bubble Beam for two more battles would actually make the run even faster. Now it's time for Lorelei, and on the Dugong, the fighting typing finally pays dividends here. It'll only use rest since it's a psychic move, so just chip it down with whatever move, let it go to sleep, and then take it out in a few turns and you can move on. This one is unlosable. Next up is Cloyster. It has incredibly high defense, and this is where the neutral damage of Psychic helps out a lot. It can't really retaliate with much, and it's a two-hit knockout, so let's just keep it rolling. Next up is Slowbro. It'll only go for Amnesia the same way that Dugong will only go for Rest, and all you need to do is use physical moves, and just like with Dugong, you can't lose here no matter what. Next up is Jinx. It's physically frail, and I do crit here for a one-shot, but I don't think that really mattered. Let's just look at the end of the fight. Now with Lapras, depending on what it wants to do, it can be very annoying. It's very similar to the Spill video I did where it becomes just a body slam trade-off where who paralyzes who first, that's who's going to win. But instead, it just goes for Confuse Ray a lot, and I do hurt myself multiple times, but it just sort of stalls out my victory a couple of turns, and eventually I take it out, and it's a very clean victory, and that's an A-plus start for Polyrath. Skipping ahead to Bruno, and I'll say it once again, Bubble Beam would have made this one quicker. Earthquake can't normally one-hit the Onyx since it has 160 base defense, but I do actually just crit the first one, and you'll see that on the second one, it can hang on. Psychic here is also another fight where it shines. It can make short work of his three fighting type Pokemon, and I do get a little lucky with some crits to make this about as fast as if I would have Bubble Beam, but this one is about as easy as you would expect. Next up is Agatha, and I did try an all special and all physical run. On the special run, it was very clear that Psychic just didn't have enough raw power that would make this fight very easy since her Pokemon have ridiculously high special. This is the sole reason that I went for Earthquake earlier, and as you can see in the footage, it makes this battle trivial, one of the easiest fights in the entire game. Psychic was just failing to knock out a Pokemon here and there, and you guys know that if you give Agatha a couple of extra turns, pretty much anything can happen with status conditions. So we are just cruising at this point, and even though we just learned Earthquake, Earthquake, its destiny has been fulfilled. I replace it with Blizzard, I heal up, I use my final PP up on Blizzard to get it up to six just for some more safety, and let's just dive in. And we've been over Lance with fighting or poison types in the past. First up is Gyarados, and it's really the only hurdle to be had here. I want to put it to sleep, but it does get a hyper beam for some decent damage before I finally get it to sleep and body slam it down and we can move on. And as far as the rest of the fight goes, and I know most of you know this already, the dragons will only use use agility since it's a psychic type move just like dugong just like Slowbro, and this battle is all but over both dragonairs aerodactyl and the dragonite are all weak to blizzard and i do outspeed all of them outside of the aerodactyl this one is very easy and blizzard really shines like it always does against lance now it's time for the champion fight and all of our minor hiccups in the run have been because of rival fights so how will this one go pidgeot is the lead and remember when i bought all those calciums earlier it was mainly for this one fight. If you were to split them up or not buy as many calciums, our birdie friend here would not be a consistent one shot and it's really important to not take unnecessary damage here. And then Alakazam comes in to rain on our parade. It goes for reflect which is fine but the problem is I get hit with a critical hit psychic and it's over just like that. Do not pass go. Do not collect $100. You're dead. On the second attempt, you see the old tried and true strategy come into play. I have to land a hypnosis, it goes for reflect, it gets put to sleep, and that allows me to freely slam it down and inch our way closer to that finish line. Right on is next. And I've mentioned its bulk several times, and this is where Blizzard is once again clutched to save a little bit of time and provide us with an easy one-shot. Gyarados is next, and I don't want to take any chances with crits or maybe multiple dragon breaths, so I want to put it to sleep, I hit the hypnosis, and I take control of the battle. Next up is the Thick Boy Arcanine, and this one is another instance where Earthquake or Bubble Beam would have helped out, because this one kind of drags on for several turns, but it's still very easy and we can just look ahead at the grand finale. And here here I outspeed and I get lucky one more time on the coin flip. The hypnosis lands and even if it woke up immediately, this one is over. Blizzard is not a one shot, but I can just use a psychic on the next turn to finish it off, end the battle, and ultimately finish up the run. And Polymath has done it. This was a very clean run and I really enjoyed the five total runs I did with this Pokemon. I'm not being sarcastic. Learning the ins and outs of Polyrath was very rewarding and I think that this video made me learn more about 
little subtle time saves in any other video in recent memory, but first, let's just kind of take a look at the stats. Polyrath finishes the game at level 62, but more important of all, we have a final in-game time of 2 hours and 36 minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, this means that not counting Mewtwo, we have a new leader on our tier list. Now after having multiple runs hit 2 hours and 38 minutes, I was beginning to think that that was the absolute peak of time, but Polyrath did something I didn't expect, and now it stands alone slightly under Mewtwo. We don't count Mewtwo. Mewtwo's the best, nothing can beat it, don't bring it up, don't say anything could ever beat Mewtwo because it can't. But Polyrath is the number one non-Mewtwo Pokemon. Now I don't want to blab on too much, so let me keep this brief. I actually did more refining here than I did in the Cloister video. I did an all physical moveset, I did an all special moveset, and then when I seen the full run and seen where things were hard and I got a feel for it, I did another run. Now on my fourth run, I made a critical blunder. I forgot that hidden max elixir outside of Rock Tunnel and I had to backtrack to get it or heal at the Poke Center. And just that little tiny bit of time caused me me to leave a little bit on the table. The only reason I did a fifth run was because I finished that run at 2 hours and 38 minutes and I just knew that if I would have got that max elixir on the correct route at the right time, I would have beaten Nidoking King and Cloyster and I really wanted to do that because you rarely get a chance to crown a new champion. Polyrath was fantastic and when future runs get better and better, this is going to be a video that you look back and point to as something that helped me reach another level of efficiency. This run was lots of fun and I always have a blast when I know there's a lot of potential, but honestly Polyrath was a little hard to master. There were a lot of little move change ups towards the end of the game and little things like utilizing Psychic to save myself turns, or hanging on to Bubble Beam a little bit longer than you would think to make things faster, or picking up Earthquake essentially just for Agatha were all tiny little things that were, definitely not the word of the day, intuitive. Honestly, at this point, I'd be interested in seeing J Rose do a Polyrath video. I say that because he's a one run and done type of channel, and there's nothing wrong with that, but I would just like to see it. The dichotomy of some of his runs compared to mine really fascinate me to be honest, and I just want to see if he makes Polyrath look average or middle of the pack, you know what I mean? And if he's already done one in the time that it took me to actually release this, then cool, I've probably already seen it. But hopefully I did a good job in this one articulating my strategies and did Polyrath justice on the tier list, and I think that's about all I have for you guys today. Now if you notice that my voice sounds a little bit more deeper, maybe I sound a little bit more nasally, it's because I've been dealing with a throat issue and I've held off on this video for a couple of days as long as I could, but I'm just not getting better as fast as I would hope, so I went ahead and recorded this. So hopefully it's not as bad and you guys didn't notice or it sounded like I was slurring my words, but I did my best and hopefully it was a decent enough video for you guys. Hope you have a wonderful rest of your week and I wish you all the most positive of vibes for sticking around this long in the video and I'll catch you guys on the next one. Bye.